Once 10,000 of Highway's most endearing structures sprang up across America, with hundreds in the Mountain State. Now, only 17 remain. West Virginia's covered bridges. From 1805, when the first covered bridge was built in Philadelphia, to the early 20th century, more than 10,000 covered bridges sprang up across the USA. But by early 1980, fewer than 900 remained. Those numbers are smaller still today. The 17 still existing in West Virginia are a testament to the skill of their creators and the determination of modern builders to preserve them for future generations. West Virginia has nearly 7,000 bridges, 99 on its 88-mile turnpike alone. Some, like the spectacular New River Gorge Bridge, are world famous. Many have won praise for the innovative designs and materials. But others bear witness to a time when crossing a stream was a formidable obstacle on a journey that often took days and weeks. When we think back uh, to historic times, and we're, we've, we've talked about some historic bridges, uh, you know, we often wonder what did the settlers face when they had to traverse uh, places uh, like West Virginia, uh, our steep uh, mountain tops and our rivers, and particularly in the springtime, or when we're having floods like we've had in recent times. Uh, how did those people really afford those streams, and how did they traverse these areas? Uh, if you look on each side of the major rivers and uh, streams in West Virginia, you'll find a parallel roadway where they had to hunt some kind of a ford or something to actually cross that stream. Those people back in those days, they waited till the streams went down, they forded the streams, and uh, I'm quite sure that uh, there were probably many lives lost in the olden days when uh, people uh, had to cross the stream and they did it uh, at the sake of their own life and uh, I'm sure it was uh, one of the most difficult things that uh, they had to face was crossing the rivers and the streams in West Virginia in the springtime. With steep mountains and few navigable rivers, the Trans-Allegheny region of West Virginia was a challenge to westward settlers. River crossings were often nothing more than a low water ford or a felled tree, but continuing movement of people and goods demanded more. And the railway to study West Virginia history is through its transport systems, railways, canals, and especially turnpikes. All of the Civil War engagements in Western Virginia uh, were fought either on the railways or on the turnpikes. I, th I can't think of one that isn't. So that the Civil War and covered bridges uh, have an intimate uh, relationship in the mid-19th century. Many of West Virginia's remaining covered bridges owe their creation to the Virginia Board of Public Works. Begun in 1816 to help provide routes, including railroads and canals for commerce and settlement, the board created the region's three major east-west roads. Most location planning and design was provided by its French-born civil engineer, Claudius Crozet, and construction financing came through private companies or from imposing tolls. As more migrants used it, Virginia in 1785 authorized construction of the Old State Road, from today's Cedar Grove to the Ohio River, completed in 1800. In 1820, the James River Company was authorized to make a road from the Virginia River to today's Goley Bridge. By 1822, it included covered bridges over the Greenbrier and Goley Rivers, and by 1829, it reached from Lewisburg to today's Montgomery. An extension to the Big Sandy River was authorized in 1829 and completed in 1832. The Northwest Turnpike was chartered in 1827 to connect Winchester with thriving Parkersburg, but not completed until 1857, partly due to competition from the federally funded National Road, now US-40. Passing through many towns still existing in northern West Virginia, the route nearly duplicated today's US-50 and Appalachian Corridor Highway D. Crozet began planning the Staunton-Parkersburg Turnpike in 1826, although funding was not authorized by the Virginia Assembly until 1838. Following old Indian paths, the road was 15 to 20 feet wide, with grades of 4% and small stones on top of bigger foundation stones for a smoother ride. Now followed by US-250, the route was finished before the Civil War. 
The earliest bridges of the time were of stone, with some remaining even today. Others were of timber, often in the form of a truss, an arrangement of structural triangles joined together with pinned or riveted connections. The arrangement determined the specific type of truss, the simplest being the traditional king post truss, basically a triangle with a vertical post in the center. The queen post truss modified this with a horizontal member in the center panel. Such bridges could accommodate spans of up to 50 feet, and up to 80 feet if they used multiple king posts. Tracing their origins to the Middle Ages, when medieval craftsmen fashioned timber roof trusses for churches, barns, and other structures, timber bridges in Europe were used for both roads and railroads. Most people in this country think that the covered bridge is an American icon that grew up uh, out of American soil. But this really isn't true at all. Um, the covered bridge had its origin in the Germanic areas in Europe. There's still a number of these left in Austria, Switzerland, and parts of Germany. So this was an imported technology as well as iron and steel and railways and what have you in the 19th century. But covered bridges are uniquely American. From late 18th century New England with its shipwright tradition, they spread throughout the new country, spurred by the turnpike movement. Covering these bridges solved the problem of long-span crossings of major rivers in a practical way by preventing truss members from deteriorating and damaging weather extremes, and thus adding an estimated 10 to 40 years up to the life of the bridge. Piers and abutments for the bridges were made from nearby stone cut by strikers, who used sledgehammers to tap mauls or other tools dragged over it. Costing as much as 30 cents, a typical three-foot cubic foot perch was set in place using heavy tongs and chains. Despite crude methods and materials, covered bridges had something available nowhere else. Call it American ingenuity, exceptional judgment or intuition. But builders with little or no knowledge of bridge analysis created spans that survive today. At least four such men had lasting influence on West Virginia. German immigrant Louis Wernwag was a craftsman and inventor who incorporated the millwright tradition into his bridges. He received his first bridge patent in 1812 and later built three bridges in western Virginia. Connecticut native Theodore Burr built dozens of timber bridges, reportedly 45 in 1818 alone, before dying in poverty. Patented in 1817, his design added arches to the King Post Truss providing a stiffness that made possible the long span bridges necessary in many western Virginia locations where multiple king post designs could not be used. Called America's first structural engineer, Colonel Stephen H. Long is the first American to use mathematical calculations to develop a truss that used boxed X's. A pamphlet on his famous Jackson Bridge on the Baltimore and Washington Turnpike included directions to builders around the country enabling them to construct wooden bridges to his patent. Massachusetts native William Howe was the first to use mathematics to analyze bridge stress. The design he patented in 1840, which substituted iron rods for wooden verticals, resulted in a heavy-duty span widely used by railroads and the forerunner of later iron bridges. Whether large or small in their spans, covered bridges proliferated for many years with hundreds built in western Virginia alone. In winter, residents were required to put snow inside their bridges to aid sled and sleigh crossings. Protected from the elements, bridge interiors were often used for brightly colored circus posters and advertisements. Also shielding those inside from being seen from outside, covered bridges were often mythologized as kissing bridges. Stories about them were handed down in various locations. In one such tale, a Greenbrier County doctor let his niece trot their buggy across the White Sulphur Springs covered bridge in violation of restrictions against traveling any faster than a walk. He then paid the magistrate $10, or his $5 fine, telling him to keep the change as he intended to let her trot back across. Along with the floods so common in mountainous western Virginia, fire was the natural enemy of wooden bridges. The Gauley River covered bridge was burned four times, the first within a year of its construction, when unemployed ferry operators vented their frustration. The fourth and final time in 1861, when it was torched by retreating Confederate troops. While fire and flood took their toll, heavy truck traffic 
hasten the end for covered bridges in West Virginia, destroying nearly 80 after 1933 until only 89 remained by 1947. Decades later, they continued to disappear at a rate of 1.5 a year. Realizing that none would be left by 2000, Division of Highways Engineers instituted a program to save remaining bridges by developing plans for rehabilitation. In 1989, West Virginia Division of Highways, along with the governor and other officials, made a commitment that we were going to preserve the remaining 17 cover bridges in the state of West Virginia. Today, we have rehabilitated and preserved all 17 of those covered bridges. West Virginia's surviving 17 covered bridges are included on the National Register of Historic Places, which has served since 1966 as the National Park Service's official list of the nation's historic places worthy of preservation. Following are their stories, listed in the order of their date of construction. Oldest and longest of West Virginia's covered bridges, and one of only six two-lane spans remaining in the United States, the Philippi Bridge stands at the junction of US 250 and US 119. It's a two-span operation uh, with roughly 138 feet clear span for each of the spans, and it's very unusual as a covered bridge in this part of the world in that it is two lanes and not a single lane. It's often called a burr truss, but in fact the diagonal framing, which you can see in the background, uh, is different than the burr patent. The story of its creation has become legendary. Lemuel Chenoweth was a 39-year-old carpenter, furniture maker, and wagon builder from Beverly. This bridge uh, is one of perhaps two dozen bridges that West Virginia's pioneer covered bridge builder Lemuel Chenoweth built. He may have built more than that, but we really don't have the records for them. We know little about Chenoweth. Uh, there are some snippets of information that he had considerable mathematical skills. He was a furniture maker, a barn builder, and what have you, and I think it's fair to say that he was a Southern sympathizer. Despite minimal schooling, he was well known in the Randolph County area for his mathematical skill and the small timber bridges he had designed and built near Weston. Confident that his burr arch truss design would be competitive, Chinnawith left his pregnant wife and eight children in 1851 to ride 250 miles on horseback to Richmond, where Virginia's Board of Public Works sought bids for bridge construction on the important road, which would also include connectors such as like the Beverly Fairmont the and Fairmont Wheeling Turnpikes. While numerous other bridge builders made their claims as to the weight that could be carried by their stone arch, iron, wire cable, or other wooden bridge types, you will have found the bridge that best forwards this crossing. And set it between two chairs and walked over it and uh, reportedly said, This is all I have to say. Any questions, gentlemen? <laughs> daring others to do the same with their models. As a late 19th century area historian noted, if the bridge were as strong in proportion to its size as Chenoweth's model, it would sustain the weight of a man 600 feet high. The contract was his. Further research in Richmond has shown that he also had the low bid. So that legend um, needs a little amplification in that the designers of bridges in this internal improvements movement uh, were very competitive. Chenoweth went on to build all the main river crossings, estimated at a dozen covered bridges, along the central part of the turnpike's routing through western Virginia. In 1872, after watching the destruction of many of these structures during the Civil War, he rebuilt the bridge in his hometown of Beverly that had been burned in 1865. His final structure lasted until 1953. While five Chenoweth bridges still existed in 1947, today only two survive, Barrickville and the state's most famous span at Philippi. 
Completed in 1852 at a cost of $12,181, the double-barreled, 286-foot-long Burr Arch Truss over the Tigert Valley River rests on abutments and central piers constructed by Emmett O'Brien, a Beverly native and skilled stonemason who used sandstone quarried from three area veins. For the structural timber needed for its two spans of clear yellow poplar, Chenoweth in 1851 found a nearby grove with trees up to five feet in diameter. The bridge's roof consisted of some 20,000 shingles hand split from chestnut or oak. The bridge became an important part of the Beverly Fairmont Turnpike, a major connector to the Staunton Parkersburg Turnpike. In the months leading up to the Civil War, control of rail lines such as the Baltimore and Ohio and bridges such as Philippi became extremely important to both sides for the transport of soldiers and their supplies. In mid-1861, after protecting Union sympathizers in Western Virginia's northern Ohio River counties, Major General George McClellan sent soldiers to the site of a Fairmont Bridge, then to the railroad junction at Grafton. He sent other troops from Parkersburg and what is now Webster Springs for the skirmish now called the first organized land action in the Civil War. On June 3rd, under Brigadier General Thomas Morris, the 3,000 men converged on Philippi, where Colonel George Porterfield, commander of Confederate forces in northwestern Virginia, was camped with 800 poorly armed men, newly recruited in Grafton. Awakened from sleep by gunfire, the rebels returned a few shots before running south in full retreat, inspiring Union news writers to call the skirmish the Philippi Races. The Philippi Bridge changed hands many times as the blue and gray fought for control of Western Virginia. The first bridge to be captured by either side, it was used for a short time as barracks for Union troops. When rebel soldiers raided the B&O Railroad west of Cumberland, Maryland in mid-1863, Philippi and the covered bridge at Rowlsburg were ordered to be burned, but were saved by the pleas of local Southern sympathizers. A short time later, the conflict brought about the creation of West Virginia as the 35th state, the only one born of the Civil War. While some siding and roofing was lost during the war, Philippi remained relatively unchanged until the late 1920s, when the need for passage for large trucks required changing its knee braces and squaring its arched portals. Extensive modifications were done in 1934 when steel girders and two new intermediate piers were added to help the original pier and abutment support a new concrete deck that replaced its original wood. Through floods and other natural disasters, it thus continued to serve U.S. 250 traffic, reputedly the only bridge of its kind still carrying a U.S. route until early 1989. The Philippi Covered Bridge was the scene of the first land battle of the Civil War. But combat wasn't as hot as this. But before learning that story, check out the rest of West Virginia's covered bridges. Barrickville Covered Bridge. Built in 1853, a year after Philippi, as part of the Fairmont Wheeling Turnpike, the Barrickville Covered Bridge crosses Buffalo Creek on Pike Street, Marion County 21, at the junction of County 250 over 32. A truss of the Burr design, it is the state's longest single-span covered bridge at 146 feet and is 20 feet wide. Chenoweth, who was still building small bridges along with his large turnpike projects, was aided in its construction by his brother Eli. James Conaway placed unmortared sandstone perches for the abutments on which sit concrete pedestals for the pair of arches that flank two multiple king post trusses. The cost for the span, which had no sides, was $1,852. The bridge escaped destruction in an 1863 raid when a nearby mill owner and Southern sympathizer provided food and rest for retreating Confederate soldiers in exchange for its safety. To protect Barrickville from the elements, R.L. Cunningham added horizontal shiplap siding in 1873. Repairs in 1934 included improving its approaches, adding steel rod hangers for a reinforcement, and a sidewalk. Steel was added beneath the bridge in 1951 to strengthen it, but in 1987 it was closed to vehicular traffic. In mid-1990, Highways announced an ambitious $3.5 million program to save the state's remaining covered bridges. Preliminary plans to restore Barrickville to its turn-of-the-century look were presented at a November 1990 town meeting by Dr. Emery L. Kemp, 
professor of civil engineering and founding director of WBU's Institute for the History of Technology and Industrial Archaeology. Because of Barrickville's worsening condition, a panel-type bridge had to be installed inside the historic structure in 1991. A $1.3 million upstream replacement began carrying Marion County 21 traffic over Buffalo Creek in 1992. Finally, in late 1997, the long-delayed restoration of the old bridge was back on track, with work to start before any more deterioration. Early in 1998, Orders Construction Company, Incorporated of St. Albans, was awarded a contract for nearly $1.5 million to replace the Barrickville covered bridge's rotted truss members with wood to match the original, install a new wooden floor system, and repair the roof. Aimed at recreating its original appearance, the restoration nevertheless included siding, which had been added after the structure's original time period. It did not include a previous sidewalk, since the bridge now serves pedestrians only. Carrollton Covered Bridge Located just six miles from the Philippi Junction of US 250 and US 119, the Carrollton Covered Bridge was once part of the Middle Fork Turnpike. The state's second longest and third oldest surviving covered span, the bridge is a multiple king post burr arch truss, 16 feet in width and 140 feet 9 inches long. About 200 vehicles a day continue to use this span over the Buchanan River on Barber County 36 at County 11 over 3 near Audra State Park. Carrollton was built in 1856 by Emmett O'Brien, the Philippi Bridge's stonemason, and his brother Daniel. Virginia Board of Public Works annual reports note that the $4,819 cost included $2,928 for 839 purchase for the abutments. The superstructure's original cost of $11.87.5 per lineal foot was raised at the end of the contract. Carrollton received some rehabilitation in 1962 and limited work in 1987, but late in 2002, Hope Brothers Contracting of Union was awarded a $398,609 contract that included replacing some timber truss members and wooden siding cleaning, treating, and painting its board and batten siding and other wood surfaces, and replacing existing concrete beams. Locust Creek Covered Bridge West Virginia's most remote covered bridge, Locust Creek, is also its only Warren Double Intersection Truss, a design patented in 1848 by England's James Warren whose connecting members form many triangles. Located near a state forest and several state parks about three miles off US 219 south of Hillsboro near the junction of Pocahontas County 20 and County 31, the span is also known as the Denmar Bridge. After a petition for a structure near the Josiah Beard Mill, the county court awarded a contract for the 13 and a half foot wide, 113 foot nine inch long bridge. Builder R. N. Bruce was paid $1,250 plus $75 for extra labor on the abutments. Completed in 1870, the bridge received repairs in 1888 and 1904 when W. N. Irvine rebuilt it, including interior supports, trusses, side panels, and roof. Siding was repainted in 1968 and a new oak floor installed with temporary supports left in place to accommodate heavier loads. In 1990, after 120 years of service, the covered bridge was bypassed by a modern concrete structure built to carry vehicular traffic on County 31. In November 2001, Orders Construction Company Incorporated of St. Albans was awarded a $406,936 contract to remove previously installed temporary supports and replace all materials necessary to restore it as a single lane pedestrian structure. Milton Covered Bridge. Also known as the Mud River Bridge for its original site or the Sinks Mill Bridge for a nearby grist mill, the Milton Bridge is perhaps the most well-traveled of the state's covered bridges. Originally located on Cabell County 25, just south of US 60, this modified Howe truss 
was once stored on the site of another bridge and now crosses a man-made pond in Milton at the site of the Pumpkin Festival in Cabell County Fairgrounds, about 1.5 miles from I-64. When early 1870s construction of the C&O Railroad brought the town increased business growth and a need for improved transportation, the county court sought a wooden bridge across Mud River, where steep banks made fording difficult. Local postmaster R. H. Baker was awarded a contract for $100 in 1874, and despite high waters in the spring, completed the structure in 1876, the year of Milton's incorporation. Resting atop sandstone block abutments, the 14-foot wide, 208-foot, 6-inch long bridge used Howe's basic design but doubled the X trusses and added two sets of cross beams between each set of tie rods and a wooden arch for more support. The Mud River Bridge served vehicular traffic until 1985 when deterioration limited its use to pedestrians only. In 1991, a new bridge was constructed upstream and the covered bridge was closed even to pedestrians in March 1996. That December, Orders Construction Company Incorporated of St. Albans was awarded a $224,840 contract to secure the bridge until restoration plans were completed. Only a short time before disastrous 1997 flooding that could have destroyed it, the bridge was stabilized and moved without roof, floorboards, or siding boards to a less flood-prone site on County 25, about a mile southeast of its original location. The bridge's storage site was on the old approaches of another former covered bridge, the James River and Kanoa Turnpike's original crossing of Mud River. While Milton residents thought the bridge had disappeared in the late 1950s, the truth was that oversized trucks had torn off its top, exposing it to the elements, resulting in rapid disintegration and ultimate collapse. On these approaches, highway officials expected to rebuild the Milton Bridge the following year, combining its sandstone blocks with the original bridge's abutments and thus maintaining the historic aspects of both. But plans changed, and in February 2001, a $900,000 contract was awarded to move the 125-year-old structure once again, this time to a location with greater opportunity for pedestrians to experience its unique link to the transportation of the past. Ahern and Associates Incorporated of South Charleston moved the bridge as it was in case new concrete abutments in the sandstone from the original site repaired the original truss, installed a stainless steel roof, and added wooden siding to resemble the original. That October, the restored structure was dedicated at the fairground site in a ceremony that also recognized the continuing efforts of individuals such as the late John Brunel, the Division of Highways Covered Bridge Program Project Manager. Despite being recognized by three separate names, Fish Creek, Hundred, and Rush Run, little else is known about the covered bridge that has continued for more than 130 years to carry vehicles over Fish Creek on Rush Run Road, Wetzel County 13, near the junction of US 250 at Hundred. The 12-foot, 9-inch wide, 36-foot long bridge is one of the state's two single king post structures and the last covered bridge in Wetzel County, which had several in the past. There are no records of the bridge's cost or of the name of its builder, thought to be relatives of C.W. Critchfield. All that is known is that the county court contracted in July 1881 for a covered bridge to cross the creek near the mouth of Rush Run. In 2001, Lone Pine Construction Incorporated of Bentleyville, Pennsylvania completed a $218,409 contract to renovate Fish Creek by adding a stainless steel roof and a new floor system of steel beams to replace wooden stringers, painting wood siding, fixing the original abutments, and repairing trusses, including salvage of four of the trusses' original timber braces. Simpson Creek Covered Bridge also built in 1881, this 14-foot, 3-inch wide, 75-foot long, multiple king post truss is almost visible from I-79 near the Meadowbrook Mall in Bridgeport. It now serves pedestrians in a park near Highways District Headquarters. Also known as the Holland Mill or Law Farm Bridge, the Simpson Creek Covered Bridge was built on the land of John Lowe by Asa Hugel, 
for $1,483. Carrying vehicles on Harrison County 24 over two, it crossed the stream named for John Simpson, a well-known peddler and Indian trader who settled in the area in 1764. Surviving the Great Flood of 1888, the structure was nevertheless washed off its abutments in 1899 and transported half a mile upstream, where it now rests on abutments of large, unmortared sandstone blocks. Despite 1984 repairs after a tree fell on its roof, the structure was closed to vehicular traffic by 1990 and later bypassed by a new concrete bridge. In 2002, Allegheny Restoration and Builders Incorporated of Morgantown completed a $380,072 contract to replace deteriorated wood in the structure and siding. Hearns Mill Covered Bridge the narrowest of West Virginia's covered bridges, the Hearns Mill Bridge, was originally built to provide business access. In January 1884, the Greenbrier County Court ordered Commissioners Harvey Handley and J.W. Johnston to report on the condition of a crossing near the S.S. Hearn Mill and the probable cost to replace it. The day the report was delivered, they were ordered to have the bridge rebuilt. The bridge was completed in July for $800. Located on Bunger Mill Road, County 40, at the junction of County 60 over 11, about three miles off US 60 near Lewisburg, the Hearns Mill covered bridge still carries traffic across Milligan Creek. The 10 and a half foot wide, 53 foot 9 inch long bridge is a local variation of the queen post design with vertical posts dividing the truss into six panels. In later years, the bridge was heavily reinforced with stringers supporting a previously wooden deck and a concrete pier at mid-span. In 2000, Grandview Construction Incorporated of Beckley was awarded a $543,932 contract to install steel beams to support the timber roadway, concrete caps on the abutments, stone guard walls, and new portal timbers, and to replace timber roof trusses, a metal roof, and wooden exterior siding. Stats Mill Covered Bridge. Now spanning a pond at the Cedar Lakes FFA FHA Conference Center near the Fair Plain Interchange off I-77 in Jackson County, the Stats Mill Covered Bridge is the only one owned by the State Board of Education. Also known as the Tug Fork Bridge for its original crossing of Tug Fork of Big Mill Creek, the bridge took its name from the grist mill and store of Enoch Stats, whose family settled in the area in the early 1800s. The location was chosen by a county court-appointed committee who modeled the bridge's design on another Tug Fork crossing. Local masons William Quincy and Jay Grimm used local cut stone to complete the abutments for a little over $710. Prominent local craftsman H.T. Hartley built the superstructure for slightly less than $904, and Stats contributed fill dirt approaches for $110, a total cost of just over $1,788. Completed in 1888, this 11-foot, 3-inch wide, 97-foot long truss was framed without stiffening arches despite its length. Its two large timber trusses feature 11 panels using Long's X-braced diagonal design. The bridge was relocated three miles to its current site as a part of a 1982 flood control project. In 1983, it was reconstructed for $104,000 at the conference center, where it now serves pedestrians. Center Point Covered Bridge. Located near the junction of West Virginia 23 and Doddridge County 10, off US 50, about 10 miles west of Salem, this 12 and a half foot wide, 42 foot long truss over Talkington Fork of McElroy Creek was built in 1889. Commissioned by the county court, the Center Point Covered Bridge cost about $1,207, including nearly $977 for abutments by Mason T.C. Ansel and E. Underwood, and $230 for carpentry by John Ash and S.H. Smith. Center Point carried vehicular traffic until it was bypassed in 1940. Privately owned in 1981, the bridge was donated to the County Historical Society 
and rehabilitated for a pedestrian trail in 1982 by local volunteers. The structure received one of the first federal T-21 grants, $236,000 for rehabilitation anticipated for 1999, but at the end of 2002, it was the next to last bridge restored under the program. The Ryder Company of Columbus, Ohio was awarded a $353,697 contract to dismantle the bridge, rebuild the abutments, then reassemble it with new floor beams, wooden siding, and a metal roof. Dense Run Covered Bridge. Also built in 1889, Dense Run is Monongalia County's only covered bridge, one of the state's shortest at nearly 13 feet wide and 40 feet long, and one of only two trusses using single king posts. It is located at Laurel Point on County 43 over 6 north of US 19 near Westover. A $448 contract awarded by the county for construction included $198 to W.A. Lohr for stone abutments and $250 to William and Joseph Mercer for the bridge's superstructure. In 1972 and 1973, before building a concrete structure just downstream, a coal company caused controversy by proposing to use the covered bridge to transport coal. Some rehabilitation in 1984 allowed the bridge to continue serving some vehicular traffic until 2004. In 2005, Hoke Brothers Contracting of Union completed a $185,684 contract to restore Dents Run, the last project in the Highways Covered Bridge program. The span was disassembled, deteriorated wooden components, including some beams, were replaced, cut stone foundations were reworked, and it was reassembled at the site using the existing metal roof. Only pedestrians now use the bridge. Sarvis Fork Covered Bridge. One of West Virginia's covered bridges has been the subject of mistaken identity for many of its nearly 125 years. Now carrying Jackson County 21 over 5 across left fork of Sandy Creek at the junction of Old US 21 near Sandyville, the Sarvis Fork Bridge is sometimes known as the Sandyville Covered Bridge. The 11 foot 9 inch wide, 101 foot 3 inch long, long truss first spanned John Carnahan's Fork, a branch of Mill Creek. In mid-1886, the county court authorized bids for abutments on the site of an old bridge above a ford on the Carnahan property. Stonemasons William Quincy and Jay Grimm, abutment builders for the Stats Mill Bridge, won the contract for $3.40 a perch, a total of nearly $1,574. Later that year, a superstructure contract was awarded to R.B. Cunningham for $9 per lineal foot, a total of $1,044. During the same time period, a contract for a second bridge at a different site on the Carnahan farm was awarded to a different builder for $64, a price that proved to be no bargain when an inspection revealed it did not meet contract standards and it vanished into history. Mysteriously, construction on the Sarvis Four covered bridge was stopped for a year. It resumed in mid-1888 after right-of-way was acquired for a new road to join the existing roads on either side of Mill Creek. After work was finished late in 1889, Wesley Sayer was awarded a contract of nearly $60 for earthwork, and T.T. T. Harley was awarded a $180 contract for woodwork at the approaches, bringing the bridge's total cost to about $2,860. At the beginning of 1890, it was finally completed. In 1924, the county court requested help from the Young State Road Commission, now the Division of Highways, to dismantle the bridge and rebuild it at its current location. A $1,050 contract was awarded to C.R. Kent, R.R. Hardesty, and E.R. Duke. Repairs in 1979 provided steel stringers to reinforce and support the wooden deck. To make the Sarvis Fork covered bridge more closely resemble the original, R.C. Construction Company and Sons Incorporated of Cutler, Ohio was awarded a $598,233 contract in 2000. The floor system was replaced with timber decking on steel stringers, 
a stainless steel roof installed, and wooden siding replaced where necessary. The bridge still carries traffic today. Fletcher Covered Bridge The Fletcher Covered Bridge is one of two remaining in Harrison County, which once had more than 60, and one of the state's last two multiple king post trusses. The 12 foot 3 inch wide, 58 foot 3 inch long structure still carries single lane traffic over right hand fork of 10 Mile Creek on County 5 over 29 Marshville Road, about a mile and a half north of US 50 near Wolf Summit. Named for a nearby family, the bridge was built in 1891 for $1,372 and sits on sandstone block abutments quarried from an adjacent hilltop. The county court contract awarded L. E. Strom $4.45 per perch for the abutments, a total of $937, and Solomon Swiger $7.25 per linear foot for the superstructure, a total of $435. A $375,964 contract awarded to Allegheny Restoration Builders Incorporated of Morgantown in 2001 required detouring local traffic while the substructure was restored and timber was repaired in truss members, deck, siding, and roof. Hoax Mill Covered Bridge. One of Greenbrier County's two covered bridges, the Hoax Mill Bridge, is located off County 48 on County 62 over 5, less than four miles west of US 219 in Ronsevert. A modified long truss with double and single diagonals in its three center panels, the 12 foot wide, 81 and a half foot long structure is open to pedestrians. In 1897, the county court appointed B.F. Mann, R.A. McDowell, and Austin B. Irwin commissioners for construction of a bridge above Smith's Mill, formerly Hoax Mill. It was completed between 1898 and 1899 at a cost of $700, including its stone abutments. Later addition of steel support beams and steel girders to replace its wooden deck allowed the bridge to continue to carry traffic over Second Creek on County 62 until deterioration necessitated a downstream replacement in 1992. Allegheny Restoration and Builders Incorporated of Morgantown was awarded a $391,646 contract in October 2001 to dismantle, repair, and reassemble the Hoax Mill Bridge. Steel girders were removed, new structural timbers were matched to existing ones using wood epoxy and joinery techniques, and new siding and a metal roof were added. Indian Creek Covered Bridge. Said to be West Virginia's most photographed covered bridge, Indian Creek also had the state's youngest builders in 18-year-old Oscar Weichel and his 16-year-old brother Ray. One of Monroe County's two remaining bridges, it is located not far from the Laurel Creek Bridge along US 219 near St. John's Church, less than four miles southeast of Union. Once part of the Mountain Lake Salt Sulphur Springs Turnpike, the bridge was built in 1898 when the county began an effort to upgrade its still very rural road system. Despite first envisioning an arched structure over Indian Creek, the county court accepted the plans of the boys, who were backed by their uncles, operators of a county sawmill. The Weichels proved themselves by setting up their own mill near the site to produce the necessary timbers and developing a tool to lift them into place. Set on hand-shaped, unmortared limestone abutments, the bridge is 11 and a half feet wide and 49 feet 3 inches long. A modified queen post howl combination truss with two center panels and an X pattern and two end sections of triangles strengthened with iron rods. Part of its $400 cost was hand-split chestnut shingles. Despite some deterioration, Indian Creek continued to serve local vehicles until US 219 opened in 1929. When the County Historical Society leased the structure in 1965 to showcase memorabilia, including horse-drawn vehicles, a brother of the builders was contracted to perform some restoration. This included replacing the floor and siding and placing new shingles 
in a deference to ancient custom by the dark night under a moon to avoid their turning up. In 2000, Hoke Brothers Contracting of Union was awarded a $334,446 contract to replace some of Indian Creek's timber roof trusses and install a new glue laminated timber deck, new wooden exterior siding, and a new roof of split shakes. Time of day was not specified. Walkersville Covered Bridge. Also known locally as the Old Red Covered Bridge for its siding, Walkersville almost wasn't a covered bridge at all. After a June 1902 petition, the Lewis County Court appointed a committee to locate a site for the span. One of three iron bridges authorized the following month. W.S. Smith was named to draft specifications and take bids for their stone abutments. A week later, Smith was appointed to construct the abutments and approaches for the Walkersville span using stone from a local farm. A few months later, the court decided to use wood instead of iron for the superstructure and awarded a $567 contract to John G. Sprigg. Completed in March 1903, this 12-foot wide, 39-foot, 3-inch long Queen Post truss crosses Right Fork of West Fork River on County 19 over 17 near US 19, about a mile south of Walkersville. Repaired and repainted in 1963, it also received limited renovation in 1984. In September 2002, Allegheny Restoration and Builders Incorporated of Morgantown was awarded a $230,859 contract to replace wooden siding and some deteriorated structural members on the metal roofed bridge, which continues to carry vehicles. Laurel Creek Covered Bridge. West Virginia's shortest covered bridge at just under 24 and a half feet long and slightly over 13 feet wide, Laurel Creek on Monroe County 23 over 4 at the junction of County 219 over 11 is also its youngest. In July 1910, three commissioners were appointed to determine a site and estimated cost for a bridge across Laurel Creek near Robert Arnott's residence near Lilydale. Members included the county road engineer and Arnott himself. After receiving their report a month later, the county court ordered construction of a covered bridge. Stone abutments were built by Lewis Miller. Arnott used seasoned oak as timbers for the superstructure of the single-span Queen Post Bridge, which has no verticals, simply two diagonals from a five-foot top cord. Lawn wick line split the original chestnut shakes for its roof, and iron components were made in Ronsevert. Completed in August 1911 at a total cost of $365, the structure is also known as the C.R. Arnott and Sons Covered Bridge. A $248,692 contract awarded in January 2000 to Hoke Brothers Contracting of Union called for installing glue laminated timber decking to support the timber roadway, replacing the metal roof with split shakes, new timber roof trusses, and new wood siding. The bridge continues to carry vehicular traffic. How did highway officials and contractors meet the challenge of restoring West Virginia's covered bridges to an appearance last seen more than a century before? While special T-21 federal funding aided these efforts after 1998, the knowledge necessary had to be relearned from the beginning. For that, workers turned to Philippi, where historians, craftsmen, community leaders, and state and federal officials had joined forces at the beginning of the decade to save the famous structure after a fiery accident nearly destroyed it. After nearly 140 years of continuous usage, battles, threatened burnings, floods, and other disasters, the covered bridge almost met a tragic end in February 1989, particularly on the West Span. The Philippi Covered Bridge was the scene of the first land battle of the Civil War, but combat wasn't as hot as this. A gasoline tanker spilled part of its load as fuel was pumped into a storage tank at a nearby convenience store. Some of it reached the bridge. A car apparently provided the spark. 
The driver was unhurt, but the auto was destroyed, along with three quarters of the bridge's superstructure. Well, it was pretty tough. Uh, really, what happened? We had a car that uh, apparently caught on fire at the edge of the bridge, fueled by a tanker that was losing gas when it was dumping gas up at a gas station. Uh, it seems like it happened. It's, this is an old structure. It was uh, dried out, and once it caught on fire, it spread through real quick. State officials, including the governor, the president of the Senate, the Speaker of the House of Delegates, and others were on site almost immediately after the fire to assure local citizens that efforts to return the historic span to its original appearance would be successful. Coordinating the cooperative effort, which ultimately involved the Division of Highways, WVU, Foresters, local fundraising groups, and contributors nationwide, was Dr. Kemp, a former president of the Public Works Historical Society who had restored other historic spans in West Virginia, Virginia, and New England. We decided, um, somewhat arbitrarily as a matter of fact, uh, that um, because of this concrete deck and steel beams, which were not original, 1934, that we would use the bridge as a workshop. And to do that, I had to design an arch system uh, that would span from each of these verticals across, and we covered it with a um, plastic sheeting, which was used by the military for airdrops. And the whole bridge then became our workshop. So we could fit members right here and uh, make sure that they, uh, the whole thing worked. The way we did the, um, the restoration is somewhat unusual compared to, say, restoring a house. Um, we cleaned all of the members that uh, remained. Under the watchful eyes of three supervisors whose former skills included construction, carpentry, and cabinet making, the crew filled the bridge's remaining pieces with epoxy. And in order to strengthen uh, members, we used uh, fiber reinforced polymers and epoxy to build up sections as required and we tried to conceal those whenever possible. The arches which were burnt uh, are cleaned and when we opened them up we could do repairs on the inside and then put them together again uh, and found out which needed to be replaced and which could be strengthened and the model that we adopted was strengthen rather than replace wherever possible. The essence of the uh, restoration work, we used that again. Um, I used it on a bridge in Virginia. Uh, the same techniques were used at Barrackville um, and uh, over at Cedar Lakes. So these techniques of using modern epoxies um, mean that we can repair a number of these members without replacing them and joined new wood using old tools and ancient construction methods such as wooden pegs, once called trunnels, literally tree nails. You can adjust the bridge. You can see these large wedges here and tighten them up, tune them like an instrument as necessary. Among the crew's discoveries were nine mini balls first lodged in the beams during the Civil War's first land battle. The lighter colored members as you go down towards that end of the bridge um, are new members. Some of them we simply couldn't salvage, they were too badly burnt. The roof was pretty well gone. Uh, the horizontal members up there are called transoms and everything above that is, uh, is new material. And I mentioned these transoms up here. The bridge is uh, 310 feet long or thereabouts. Um, and with a solid board siding on it, unlike uh, open bridges, uh, lateral wind loads uh, are pretty heavy on a bridge like this. And so there's truss work and you can see the X's. Um, that gives you a horizontal wind truss at that level and the deck serves as another lateral stiffening so that the bridge is really quite stiff um, from a lateral point of view. The timber is uh, poplar yellow poplar and um, the Forestry Association of West Virginia uh, provided these trees. They came up from the southern part of the state uh, to Beelington where we set up a sawmill and we could saw them to the side. A couple of them in here are over 50 feet long 
and uh, we didn't need to have any um, splices in them. So this is a testimony to the internal improvements movement uh, to the development of Western Virginia uh, before the Civil War and is one of the most frequently uh, visited historic sites in the state. So it is, it is a real symbol of West Virginia history in the 19th century. When major restoration efforts had been completed, a $1.2 million contract was awarded to install a new deck, sidewalk, and handrail system, provide scour protection for the bridge pier, and repoint the stonework. To prevent a future catastrophe, a fire suppression system was added. Restoration costs totaled approximately 265 times the span's original price, or close to $3.2 million. Philippi's return to service on September 16, 1991, two years and seven months after fire nearly destroyed it, signaled the beginning of a new era for covered bridges in West Virginia, and a new sense of pride and wonder for generations yet to come. Discovering these transportation treasures provides beautiful mountain scenery while traveling to West Virginia's most endearing highway structures, its 17 remaining covered bridges.